Yeah, so that's okay. I don't know if anyone's seen this guy around the place. It's a bit of a dodgy looking character, but I believe he's uh, circulating. So, um, this is the team. There's four of us who did this survey and are currently writing it up, and we're hoping to get it published uh, in the new year. Um, really, Thomas. We don't want to make this into a complete mutual admiration session, but Thomas was instrumental to this project. It was really his inspiration and idea uh, behind it, so all credit to him. Um, there he is. Naomi, uh, who works at Cumbria University. She's a plant ecologist, and she's also the founder of the Cumbria Forest Food Network. And um, she managed to secure a small amount of money from Cumbria University to support this work. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. cool, okay. Uh, Emma, is Emma here? No. Yes, Emma, hi. <laughs> I, hadn't, I knew I hadn't seen you. So Emma from uh, Exeter University who is researching raspberry production in forest gardens. She has a Daphne Jackson Fellowship for people returning to academia and is supported by one of the research councils. And me, not my favorite photograph of myself, but there you go. Uh, I'm the Permaculture Research Coordinator, and for the last three years, I've been leading the Permaculture Association's 10-year forest garden research project. That is a separate project to what I'm gonna talk about today, but that's the forest garden work that I was doing before uh, I got involved in this current piece of work. So this is a collaborative effort. And we pulled together data from three different surveys that were conducted between 2011 and the end of 2014 uh, of forest gardens in the temperate zone. And you'd be amazed how difficult it is to get a clear definition of where, <laughs> what the temperate zone is. But the data that we've analysed includes northern Italy, uh, the east and west coast of uh, North America, but not the bottom bits of North America or the bottom bits of Italy or Spain. Um, and we have included New Zealand and the very southeast corner of Australia. And we've included Canada, although you might say that's the snowy zone. So they're the areas that we've featured and then all of Northern and Central uh, Europe. That's where this, the, the gardens in the survey come from. Um, some of them come from Cumbria, I should say that first. That's very easy, that's definitely temperate. So Cumbria Forest Foods Network conducted a survey um, both online and uh, physically. Uh, the main body of the survey was um, a survey monkey that Thomas created and ran in 2014. Uh, Thomas then went on a kind of tour, grand tour of forest gardens last year in this and added some more data to the survey. So in total, we found over 160 forest gardens um, giving us some data. And after a lot of filtering and sieving, we decided we got 127 that had given us enough data to actually be worth including in the survey. Some had just given us an address and a name. Uh, not surprisingly, considering that all four of the people involved are UK-based, the survey, more than half of, this is by number, not percentage, but more than half of the gardens are in the UK, very widely spread from Devon, uh, from Cornwall up to Scotland. Uh, we've got a reasonable number in Europe and a reasonable number in USA and Canada, and one other, which is New one New Zealand garden. Um, and we were very pleased with... Uh, how there seems to be an exponential growth in forest gardens. In 1980, none of the forest gardens existed. Every one of the forest gardens we looked at has come into existence since 1980. And you can see that decade by decade, this green bar is only the first four years of the 2010s. So assuming that we carry on, the green bar will be off the top of the scale by the time we get to 2019. You can see we've had big growth. And if we look at the number of forest gardens in our survey, um, Actually, the first five, if, we, if you imagine zero in 1980 and the first five in existence by 1990, 
and so on uh, up. So you can see the huge growth. And I did um, some rough figures for what this exponential growth would mean uh, if it carried on to uh, 2100. And there was something like half a million for If this carries on, we'll have about half a million forest gardens in our survey by uh, 2100. So that's pretty, that's pretty good. Forest gardens that seem to be going places. We classified the gardens as private, community or commercial. And you see that roughly speaking, half of them are private and a quarter community and nearly a quarter commercial. And then there's a few which identified as covering more than one of those uh, goals. So a private garden is basically someone's back garden or own personal piece of land. Not to say they don't let other people onto it, but it's theirs. Uh, a community garden is something owned and run for the benefit of the community, and a commercial garden is primarily existing to be a commercial money-making enterprise. Uh, we had roughly even splits between farm and rural areas and urban areas. Uh, we had massive range in size, which was, yeah, one of the most... <laughs> Challenging things to try and kind of analyse. Sizes range between 5 square metres and 30 hectares. So 5 square metres is not much bigger than this platform I'm standing on. 30 hectares obviously is massive. Uh, some are tiny, some are very large. So we've got a real spread with six sites covering more than 5 hectares. The mean size is a hectare and the median and the mode are one acre. Largely because people just told us it was an acre in size, so you know it's not very accurate. So Thomas has suggested that maybe the term forest garden isn't really the right term, or we should split the term. So we're playing with the idea of forest garden, food forest, and forage forest. Forest garden being small, food forest being around an acre, uh, or, or larger, and forage gardens being the, the really big ones. I, oh, it's dropped off the bottom, over five uh, hectares. We also asked about people's goals, and um, this is a scale on which if everybody in the survey said that food self-reliance was their top goal, it would score one, basically. And if everybody said that food self-reliance was their least important goal, it would score six. So the lower the number, the more important this is. So we've got a very clear split, I think, between the first three, food self-reliance, biodiversity, and education, and the second three, research, commercial production, and uh, what people described as other. 49 people told us other. Nicely, I think, the most common was fun, which is nice. So some people want to have fun from their forest garden. Great, and why didn't we ask them that? But then there's a huge list of, things, of reasons that people are motivated by. Harvesting medicine, connection with the land, self-education, natural beauty, relaxation, cause our soil carbon sink figuring out what works and why, fodder crops, firewoods, nursery, growing food for low-income neighbours, having a hobby, rest, growing basket-making materials, creating pasture and camping. So people are excited about forest gardens for a massive range of reasons, and I haven't put all of them on there. Then we asked people to rate their goals, again, on a similar scale, one, everybody's absolutely delighted, it's all absolutely wonderful, it's much better than we could ever have imagined, and four is, really, we didn't meet that goal at all. Um, and interestingly, the top goal, biodiversity, that was rated second when people said, what is the most important goal to you? So that's pretty good. So biodiversity is delivering what people want. People say they want biodiversity from their garden, and they're getting it. But... The one that people said they wanted most was food self-reliance, and actually that's coming way down the list in what it's actually uh, delivering. So this suggests that people's expectations of biodiversity, yes, we're getting there. Education seems pretty good as well, but food self-reliance, not so good. People aren't really happy with the food self-reliance they're getting uh, from their garden, and even worse, commercial production. People aren't happy with the uh, degree of commercial success they're getting from uh, their garden. Um, we've done, Naomi's doing some very complex analysis of the most common species and the most common species groups uh, as guilds, but just general combinations, and we'll map that against climate 
areas in different parts of the world. So how does North America differ from Cumbria, for example? But our initial analysis suggests that, perhaps unsurprisingly, nearly everybody has apple trees. That seems to be the one, the only plant that actually is, across all forest gardens people have, is apple. Plum, pear, cherry and hazel are next. Blackberries and currants do well in the shrubs. But, very interestingly, I think, Apart from apples, not a single species is grown by more than half the gardeners. And in fact, perhaps for me, the most interesting thing so far from this survey is the massive diversity of plants being grown. Um, huge range, well over 200 species and countless varieties. Um, and I should have had a little forest garden Oscar to give out to Graham, who's down there, who managed to achieve 224 uh, different uh, varieties uh, listed on his list. And, uh, yeah, we'll give him a round of applause because that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. And very interestingly, and if anyone's looking for a nice academic study to do, the other winner of the Oscar for Most Berry Garden is the Reading International Solidarity Centre Roof Garden. So they've got more than 200 species and varieties on a roof, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I didn't really think we'd have forest gardens on a roof. So, you know, this is great. We haven't got anybody here from... Risk, have we? No, what a shame. But in, in absence, we give them their award. Um, hours worked per week. I think this is an area that needs a lot more research because the results are so varied. Some people are putting in one hour or less a week and some people are putting in 20 or more hours a week. So there's a huge spread. Obviously, we need to map this against the size of the garden. If you've got a garden that's five square metres, it might not be surprising that you're putting in one hour or less a week. If you've got 35 acres or hectares, it might be you know, at the other end. But it'll be very interesting to see how this maps against size and whether some people who are running a big space are doing so with very little labour and vice, vice versa. So we'll wait and see where this takes us. Uh, work still to do. We've got several questions which need more analysis. Most common species needs a lot more work because it's so varied. I think it would just be great to have a list of all the species being grown in all the forest gardens that we've surveyed. Uh, the favourite guild, which we asked people about, which we haven't really analysed yet. People's biggest challenges, which they were asked to just describe what their biggest challenge was and the greatest lesson that they've learned. So we're looking forward, I think, to getting some stuff from that, which hopefully will be practical advice to pass on to new and aspiring forest gardeners. Um, we'd like to keep on gathering responses to the first survey. Anyone here is running a forest garden in the temperate zone? Um, the survey's still live on SurveyMonkey. Have a look. Uh, yeah. How do people find the link, Thomas? Is it still live? It uh, Through the association. Is it still live on the association website? In other questions. Uh, okay, it's... The survey uh, doesn't work uh, at the moment. We t took it offline because okay. we wanted it uh, clear to find We wanted points. to analyze. It's okay. And we will create okay. a new survey okay. that uh, will widely, you. more widely publicized. So okay. hopefully everybody will hear of that. Okay, so we've taken it down in order to do the analysis of the first lot. But then there'll be a second generation. So if you want to rush to do the survey, you'll have to hold on uh, for, for a little while longer. Um, get the initial findings published, which we want to do in an academic journal, which we think we would like to say would be the first bit of academic... Someone here will probably correct me, but we'd like to think it's going to be the first proper academic uh, piece of work on temperate forest gardens published uh, in a journal. So we're quite excited about that. Um, almost all the participants, we're happy to say, said they would be happy to work with us again. So we're going to do a new and deeper survey, and we've got a much better idea now of where the interesting questions need teasing out and more subtlety needs to be explored from some of those question, questions. And, of course, everybody, especially the members of the team, needs to read Thomas's book, which is imminently going to appear on Forest Gardens. So if you're a Forest Garden enthusiast, Thomas is not allowed, of course, to um, plug his own book here. So I'm sneakily going to do it for him. Uh, when's it out, Thomas? Imminently. 2016. Oh, OK. Not, not so imminently. OK. All right. Uh, and this is Old Slenningford in North Yorkshire, which some of you might know. Um, I guess we've got lots of harvest from the conference, but I'm also thinking that we're all probably, those of us in the temperate zone, are going to be going home to harvest 
I was harvesting my apples on Sunday from my little bit of forest garden. So I hope you get some good harvest in terms of knowledge and learning and friendship from the conference. And I wish you all a very happy apple, blackberry, whatever else harvest when you return to your little patch of land. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so now there will be time for questions. Um, uh, it'd be great. Do we have a steward? So, aha, uh -huh, you've got that. So, uh, sorry. Stephanie. Stephanie will come around and, uh, like, if you raise your hand, then ask your question. And please be succinct with your question. So, short question and, uh, or a short statement followed by a question. Thank you very much. And, Chris. Uh, we'll try to answer. <laughs> I shall try. Here's a question. Steve Mann, Kansas City. I'm wondering if you would ask uh, how many hours at the age, each age of the garden. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, what we've discovered from this survey, like the, the plant data, data that we've got from the survey is absolutely fantastic and really detailed. And in a sense, by the time that's on analyzed, we're going to have a really clear, detailed picture of what plants people are growing and what guilds they're growing them in and all that stuff. But then there's other really interesting things like how much time are putting people in, when, how much, what's the relationship between the age of the garden, as you say, and, and people's effort and the size of the garden and the effort. Um, so we have, this survey cannot answer those questions. What it can say is that's really interesting and we've identified that as something that we need to explore further. So I think the next survey that we do, we should really start to, having done plants, I think, I don't know what other people in the team feel, but I feel we've kind of got enough data on plants for now. I think the next stage is to start to think about exactly this kind of question about how much labour do you put in and does that have any relation in people's feeling to what they're harvesting? You know, who knows? What's the learning that we can do from that and how does that relate to uh, the age uh, of the forest gardens? And uh, one thing we need to think about with that is how are we defining labour here anyway? I think one of the reasons we've got such a huge diversity is because for some people just popping out, like if I think about the work I put into my garden, Sunday morning I went out with my kids and harvested the apples. Well, that didn't really feel like work. It was just something that we were doing as a family in the sunshine. So I think we need to explore a bit, particularly for like the community gardens versus the commercial gardens. They're probably answering this question in a very different way. So yeah, that's definitely on our list for the next stage. Uh, Margaret Lingwood, UK. I was just re relating to the last question, also the time of year. Because, um, for example, I spend a lot of time in the winter pruning, but not in the summer. So the question, you know, how much time do I spend per week, would be very difficult to answer. Yeah. Okay, that's a, a methodological question. We did ask people to say for the four seasons how many hours they put in, but most people just put the same answer. So in theory, we thought we were going to generate that data because we thought we'd ask that question. But the vast majority of people who put 10 hours in winter put 10 hours in spring and summer and autumn as well. So we need to ask the question in a different way that teases out some of that uh, subtlety. Other people, a small number, said, you know, I'm doing two hours in the winter and 15 hours in the summer. Or maybe in your case, the other way around. But not enough to give us a, a sample that we could really analyse. So it's definitely, we need to ask that question in a much more subtle and clear way to say to people, Please be more realistic about the difference between uh, winter and, and autumn. It also maybe because people don't... I mean, I think for myself, I've got a very vague idea of that. You know, I really would struggle to say how many hours I put in it for mine. I don't know, you know, maybe if you're doing it commercially, you're really clear. But I think, I think it's a difficult... Those are very difficult questions to, to answer, actually, for people. Other questions? Uh, hi, my name is Jesse from uh, Santa Barbara, California. And one of my questions would be, uh, do you guys have a specific uh, goal for this survey as far as trying to gain metrics on whether uh, forest gardens are uh, financially viable, uh, commercially viable? Um, and then for the food security part, you know, uh, is it food security for one person, for a family, for a community, for a bioregion, yeah. stuff yeah. like that. So um, trying to get a differentiation between what people are after and if it's viable. I mean, in the broadest sense, yes, we'd like to answer all those questions. I guess what's happened with this is that we've kind of, or Thomas really, has just chucked a big net 
out there and see what fish end up in our net. So we've, the, the plant data we've got is really, really good. I think a lot of those questions that you're asking were answered, if at all, were asked rather, if at all, very broadly in the survey. So I think what we've done is show there's enough, 127 gardens is enough for us to say there's some interest in this. That graph that shows the exponential growth shows that there's going to be more interest in this. And somebody needs to get the ball rolling in getting the research community to start to think about forest gardens. So I think if Thomas and I had a wish list, and, and Emma and Naomi, we'd probably have, you know, it's probably 20 different academic papers could come out of forest gardens easily. So that's the work of us and a lot of other people to, to, to sign up for that. I think what we want to do is put a marker down with this paper to say temperate forest gardens are out there, they're really interesting, they're growing in numbers, and people ought to be really doing some research on them. Uh, Emma's doing her research on raspberry production, which is very quite a specific thing, and other people who will you know, will hopefully join up and want to look at some of those um, commercial aspects, the yield aspects, all that stuff. So there's kind of a general wish to do all of that, but we aren't, it's going to take us a while to get around to that. Thomas, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, maybe to add to that in a way. So this uh, was a baseline survey. So what we're really doing is establishing who does what, where, and kind of a bit of detail to that. Um, and like doing that baseline survey with a lot of practitioners who basically are not specialist researchers. Yeah. You know, you can only go so deep or otherwise people just won't bother filling it in. So we decided, okay, so we gather this data and in some ways it's, uh, it's an offer or in, so, in some other way a provocation to the permaculture community. You know, so here is some data now some baseline data, and there's a, it uh, it's, uh, asks as many questions as it gives answers, hopefully it asks more questions, and one of those is the one you're asking. So anybody who has got a will to follow any of those questions uh, is very much encouraged to do so, and um, the data that we gathered, we asked whether we can pass that on, and so most of the source data that we use for this survey is available to people doing research. So do get in touch with Chris and we can make, that, make a lot of that data available. Uh, and then, then you can follow your own specialist questions and kind of get more depth to it. And the second survey that we're hopefully gonna get, get onto will uh, iron out some of the snacks that we discovered with the first survey and hopefully we also can do a follow-on survey that people can fill in every year or every three years, kind of how are you getting on with your yields, how are you getting on with your species health and stuff. Um, I don't think I put my contact details up. My email is research at permaculture.org.uk. If you go on the Permaculture uh, Britain website, you'll find me very easily under the research um, tab on the top. Right. Okay, Stephanie, uh, question there, like in the middle there. Uh, Hi, uh, Tanya from Tring. Firstly, really great to see some data. I really find that interesting. But I was wondering, uh, when it came to meeting goals, I thought that was a really good question. What are your goals and did you meet them? Um, and I was interested, was there a statistically significant difference between those numbers? Because they look pretty similar to me, actually. Even if you ordered them, you know, you said like 1.53, 1.59, those sound like quite similar numbers. Those, those are, but if you look at the... Um, if you look at the... Um what was the, the one that was uh, poorly scored? The food self-reliance one. Yep. You'll see that, that is substan there's a massive difference between that and biodiversity. Remembering that people can only answer one, two, three, four, one, yeah, two, three, or four a, for this. Yeah, it's quite a small. I just, so, but also so yeah, I the, thought... The, the top ones, I mean, yeah. that's not, you know, that's neither here nor there, the first two. Yeah. But, the, but considering that people said that food self-reliance was clearly their top goal, and then they said they're really not achieving that, Conversely, well, the biodiversity, they're, yeah. they're doing... I mean, that was my are. next it's curiosity, not, actually, because yeah. you've got one surpasses expectations, four fails to meet expectations, so presumably two, or maybe 2.5, is meets expectations. Um, so I wonder if you're being a little bit hard there, because if you're scoring 2.1, yeah, that's yeah. kind of like um, pretty much so, meets yeah. expectations, yeah. isn't it? I don't know. Um, so the questions that we asked on that score, I think, were... Yeah, so like all the, the, the like, score, like scoring, like scoring was... Uh, so exceeds expectation is one, uh, yeah. two is meets expectations, okay. three is does not fulfill expectations, okay. and four doesn't succeed. Yeah, anything anything okay. over two 
That okay. is that is not a good score. That's useful clarity. Okay, then. so uh, yeah, thanks, Thomas. That's, that is very useful. Anything under two, people are pretty happy. Anything over two, you know, that's that's not looking so good. I, I'm feeling charitable, I suppose, because I think probably people's expectations of self-reliance are often pretty high. Yeah, well, but that needs teasing. That needs teasing out definitely. That's but it's really we interesting need to, go back to have to. that. So yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So next question. Um, thank you, Rosie from Essex. Um, I'm interested in potentially the one that you haven't analysed, the challenges, because our experience is that um, some of the plants that you put in, the ground cover is completely destroyed by the leaf litter, and the raspberries are very productive, but they go mouldy before you've had a chance to eat them. Um, so uh, presumably you'll be analysing it in more detail. Yes, we asked for that as a qualitative rather than a quantitative answer, so people could just a answer anything they liked, which is why it's been, at this stage to do any proper analysis is going to be... I mean, we can give a list, and we can say six people said this and four people said that, but it's, it's just going to be a huge list. So I think that's something we could go back to. Now we've got some idea of what's emerging as the, the problems, and maybe do a scoring exercise or something. So we will be able to produce a big list and I can tell you now, slugs and deer have come out as two of the, the absolutely top uh, things. Um, but then, you know, there may just be one person who said some things on there, and that still might be quite interesting. So, um, yeah, we, we need to give some thought to that, and it's something that, again, we'd like to go back and explore uh, in more depth. I think the things won't greatly surprise anyone. I mean, anyone who's done any forest gardening will know, you know, if you, if you have deer or rabbits, you're really in trouble, and if you've got slugs, that's pretty annoying as well. Um, and there's other there's other things about you know access to vandalism and and who owns the land and you know there's all those all those things. If you read the land magazine, you know it's all it's all in there all the time about the problems that people have with those uh, things, falling out with your neighbours, and you know all those kind of things are on the list. But um. okay, we've got time for one more question. I find it very interesting. And I'm wondering about the, the geographical region, that you have so many UK results and then quite a few in Europe and then a lot less beyond that. Are you interested in like expanding that re uh, region or do you have reasons why certain regions are not... I, I didn't hear anything from Russia, for example, or yeah, Eastern it's Europe. It's a great question. I mean, it's completely... It is like we just chuck a, chucked a net out there and saw what fish came in the net. Obviously, for us being in the UK, like we've got Cumbria is best represented because Cumbria is, you know, Naomi's running the Cumbria Forest Food Network. So if you look at our map, I mean, you can't, it's not, if you look at our map, you'd think that, you know, 10% of the forest gardens in the world are in Cumbria. I mean, it's obviously <laughs> ridiculous. It, uh, although it could be, maybe, maybe it's forest garden paradise. Okay. Um, so, uh, it, so, for example, there was one person in northern Italy found our survey and obviously really liked it. And so we got 10 gardens from northern Italy <laughs> because of that one person. They sent all their mates and their mates responded. You know, it's typical snowball research. It's how it works. One person goes to a load of other people. Yeah. So it's completely unrepresentative. It's completely random. Who the person from New Zealand was, I don't know. It's great <laughs> to have them in there. We'd like to have a dozen people from New Zealand. So Russia, we've got none from... East, we've got some from Central Europe but none from Eastern Europe, you know. Uh, so these are all, it, it is just about us really targeting those areas and thinking about how we make contacts in those areas, how we reach out to those people. Um, yeah, we didn't, we had no idea what would come back. Yeah. So, you know, we haven't attempted it scientifically in that sense and we need to for the next stage to, to spread. Thank you, Chris. Um, Thank you. So